the second lesson, and that's the one I particularly focused on, and the, and the sermon we will draw from this morning, is the word of St. Paul. He's writing to a young pastor, Timothy, uh, who is his, it is his son in the faith. That's the way he talks about Timothy. Timothy is just starting a kind of big pastoral ministry for a young man in the city of Ephesus, today's age of minor. And in the process of, of starting this church, St. Paul feels he has a need. So he writes two letters, actually, to Timothy. Uh, Timothy has been with him in prison, and now Timothy is back in Ephesus, and St. Paul is writing to him and trying to give him some good information for a, for a young pastor. And that's where we start this morning. St. Paul's first letter to Timothy, the beginning of the second verse. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, for all who are in high position, that they may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at exactly the right time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, telling the truth I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarrel. I'm going to stop there for just a second and maybe a brief introduction. In the second letter that St. Paul writes to Timothy, he refers to himself as the chief of sinners because he was one who persecuted the church and that line was right like too quickly. But before he was thrown to the ground and talked to at a kind of moment to moment with Jesus, he was on the wrong way in every part of his life, but he became, in that moment, one of the greatest missionaries in the history of humanity. And again, that second letter to Timothy, he said, he says that I am the chief of sinners because I persecuted the church. I brought people up, sent them to prison if they confessed Christ, and even if they killed them. And so now he continues, probably his very best words, in fact, I mentioned them in Bible study this morning, in Galatians chapter 2, St. Paul says, and it's one of those words we probably put in our heart and in our head, where he says, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I have over the years just memorized so many of these greatest of words, for they are words to live by. For me to live is Christ. I know the secret of contentment, St. Paul says. I have learned that I can do all things through Christ, his great words. This is not one of his great words I'm reading this morning. This is probably things I wish St. Paul had written, but nevertheless, it's in the Holy Scripture, and we need to hear it, and whatever we can, to learn from it, or in the sermon. Continuing then in this reading from 1 Timothy, verse 9. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess goodness and godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. 
I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was born first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. The woman was deceived, and she became a transgressor. For yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now this is the word of the Lord. I, I really enjoyed most just standing right in front of you real close and, and preaching there. Uh, but there are those times when when sermons are uh, how can you say it? Difficult uh, when sermons are more teaching than they are in conversations. Uh, and so anyway, it seems to me that for this sermon and for what the Lord has laid on my heart for this day, it seems that it's probably better that I just stand in the pulpit this morning. But I want to read that section again. So open it up in your Bible or your Bible in your book to page four. Page four. And it's the last part of this lesson that St. Paul writes to young Timothy as he is going to be a pastor in this congregation of Um Let's start with verse 8. Verse 8, just above that in italics. I desire then that in every place the men should pray lifting holy hands without anger or quarrel. And now, likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, and with, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness and good works. Let a woman learn quiet with all submissive. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but a woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Quite frankly, I can't believe that St. Paul's writing this. And for many reasons, not the least of which, let me just give you a few. In the 10th or the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, St. Paul is giving instructions to the church at Corinth. And he writes this as he begins his chapter on public worship. What does the church look like when it worships? And he writes, when men pray publicly, or when they prophesy is the way it usually is. And as we hear prophesy, we think, usually think about predicting the future. This has nothing to do with that whatsoever. It's a fundamental word for prophesy, which simply means to preach. And he says, so when men pray, or when they preach, they should not cover their heads. And this is over against all kinds of religious practices, Jewish and Christian and otherwise. And then he goes on, he said, but when women pray, or when women preach, they should cover their head. And that's a sign of their special kind of relationship with God and with their husbands. So he presupposes that women are going to preach and that they are going to pray publicly. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But now we're all of a sudden in that letter to Timothy in which there is a, if you will, a denigration of the role of women, unless she's having babies, that seems to be so unpalled. 
because he's the same one who singles out in this eight or the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. He singles out Lydia, remember? Lydia becomes a Christian as he and his, his followers and his Paul's followers, probably little Timothy at that point, uh, as they sit down along the banks and they begin to converse with Jews who have been kicked out of Rome by Emperor Claudius because Claudius thinks the Jews are, are upsetting the city of Rome. Anyway, there's a lot of Jews there, and here's Paul, and here's his disciples, and they're sitting down and they're talking about, about the Jew. They're talking about the Son of God. They're talking about the one whom God has sent to redeem all Israel and all nations and all people. And Lydia and some of her close friends listen. And Lydia says, I want to learn so much more. You want to go home and you can stay with us. We're staying right now. And he said, Well, I'm staying at the camp. No, he said, Where are you right now? Well, that would be. And so Lydia becomes one of the first and best kinds of, of uh, church in the whole. And these signals are out. Or later on, there's two, two powerful, powerful Jewish leaders by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. And if you go to the 18th chapter, the book of Acts, you're going to find there that Paul gets to know Aquila and Priscilla, and he introduces them to another new, brand new Christian. Who is, a, who, who is a, a gifted, gifted Old Testament scholar, but has learned just a little bit about Jesus and wants to learn so much more. And so Paul introduces Apollos. Are you still listening? This is a lot to put together. He introduces them to, uh, to uh, Priscilla and Aquila. And you notice I put Priscilla this time first, not Aquila. Because that's the way, once he's introduced, to Aquila and Priscilla, he finds out that who's the leader of that group. Priscilla is, and so the rest of his references to, and there are references in other books of the New Testament, the St. Paul right? Now, it's always Priscilla and Aquila. So it seems to be just exactly the opposite of what he's telling us in First Timothy. And so he writes to Priscilla and Aquila, <laughs> <laughs> and Apollos sits down at their feet and becomes one of the finest Old Testament, New Testament Jesus scholars in the history of the church, thanks to Priscilla and the world. And then in the 16th chapter of Romans, the last chapter, he goes for a long list, St. Paul says, all these people in Rome, I want you to greet them for me. I want you to say hello to them. I want you to remember them. I want you to remind them of the time we spent. Here. And then he comes to a, a, a woman by the name of Junia, J U N I A. And Junia is obviously a woman's name. And she is also a relative, like a cousin or a second cousin or something. But he talks about his. Is a kinship with Julia, who is a deacon in the church, and obviously one of his kind of favorite when he's called on people. The point is that St. Paul does not, in any way, in other passages, with the exception of one, maybe in 1 Corinthians 14, which we won't go into today, but he lifts up in every way he can the ministry the gifts of women in this, what is they're calling it? I think they're calling it a, an ecclesia, a, a church, to call out ones who follow, and not only follow, who lead the greatest movement this world of ours has ever known. The proclamation and life of Christ who has redeemed this world from everything that would destroy us who gives to us a brand new life through his Holy Spirit, who gives his life for us that my sins might be forgiven and I live forever, full in the face of my heavenly Father and by the grace of my Lord. You know it, you know it.
But St. Paul, at this point, I would sit down and remind him, I would say, Paul, we need to talk. Who were the very first people at the empty tomb? He would think probably said, well, uh, I think it was the two Marys in Joanna. Right? Yeah. Who was first at the tomb? Well, it was Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Who were the first missionaries of the resurrection? It wasn't men. They sat home and wondered what was going on. Well, the women kept telling everybody they couldn't, that he's risen from the dead. Anyway, how do we, how do we in our lives manage the whole grace that God has given us? The package, the beauty, the sinfulness that is ours, whether male or female. The Lutheran Church was really said it, and I think this is one of the reasons why this is in this lesson, is because the Lutheran Church was very said does not ordain women. I have six much, much younger friends who are members of the churches I served in time past who are now pastors, obviously all of them in other denominations. This is not one of our best moments or our best decisions. But that's where we are because we're still growing. We're still growing. The church is still growing. And all those things we thought we had settled, and all those great moments the Lord still has in store for us. And Lord knows, at this point in the history of this United States, the church has its work cut out for it because so much of what we've done, so much of the way we've lived, so much of the way we grew, the, the world around us, this nation around us, just quit listening because there is so much hypocrisy in the church, because we are so in on ourselves without carrying that vision to the world. We're so happy with the way things are that, well, the church is undergoing a huge loss of membership. Not because people aren't looking for life and love and power and peace and tomorrow, but because we've done such a rotten job so long of sharing it so into ourselves. Now, how does that work in your life? Just a question. Where, where are you in your relationship with your Heavenly Father, with your Lord Jehovah, and then how deeply do you celebrate your baptism every day? Say, whoa, 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 in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, by God's grace, I have a destiny, and I have a power, and a peace, and a purpose in my life. Where are you? I'm just talking to Steve. We visited on, on Friday morning. And I'm asking that is it seems to me, test this and try this out, that as we grow up in life, maybe about the time of confirmation, as we grow up in life and we begin to come in our teenage years, maybe earlier, with the question of, of God. Is there a God? And if there is, is there any way of knowing him? Or is that just a distant past is so busy creating it doesn't have time for little old earth anymore. But as we wrestle with the question of God, and, and do we believe him or don't we believe him? And whether through the period of my life after that I begin to wrestle with if I believe in God, what do I do about it? And whether it's a reading or whether it's in touch with another Christian or whether it's in my family or all the ways that I come to terms with whether or not it's necessary, if it's even possible to know God. However it happens, by God's grace, that just that, yeah, I think I believe in God. I think I believe in God. And it would begin to to grow in, from that moment into something that we, we call, I guess we call it faith. 
and, and we learn, maybe in confirmation, maybe in other ways we learn. I believe in God the Father, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the Holy Spirit. And that just that that simple kind of belief system begins begins to grow as I begin to mature and life gives me all the all the goods and bads that it does. And that, that just that kind of general belief in a God who created something or other, maybe even me, uh, where it comes out of faith. And I begin to say, yeah, I, I think I believe. And so whether or not that issues of finding a church or finding a gathering of people who celebrate and know the precious love of God in Christ in their daily life, that belief grows into faith. And it may manifest itself in a lot of different ways. Occasionally I go to church, or maybe I begin to go to church very often, or maybe I started a Bible study class. But, but that, that belief goes goes into to faith. And that, that faith now begins somehow or other, in this world of ours and in my life, uh, to mature. Uh, <laughs> so it becomes, I really trust God. I, I come and know Him. And, and, I, and I trust that when He has said, I forgive you because my Son I've sent to take upon you all of his love and grace and all of his direction and presence through his Holy Spirit and I take from you your sins and I put them on him and in justice and in truth he dies in a justice and truth you are never able to live he dies for you your sins are gone and you're a brand new human being not in just for the rest of your life, for tomorrow. For tomorrow I begin the day in my baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just, just tomorrow, that's, a, that's a, about as much as I can handle. And that faith goes into a, into a trust where he becomes more and more, where they become, where you become, the church becomes more and more the center of the way I find meaning in life, I find purpose in life, I find power in life, I find peace, I even find peace in life. And I wonder, is that, that pretty much is it? I wonder, no, there's at least one more, and that's gratitude. How much of my life do I give? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, just there's a church do I do I give sacrificially or what's left over at the end of the week or month? And is there in my life just a gratitude every day, every night, every minute that I am a daughter of the eternal creator? I am a little sister of Jesus. I am a presence of God's Holy Spirit. And I, and I can't stop saying thank you. I just look for bright new ways to care for other people. I think I'm getting close to where Jesus says, love your neighbors, yourself, not just not just close neighbors, but the distant neighbors, all those on the world who don't know God's love in Christ. And so I've got to give, give up my life in whatever ways I can. Because my life is a life in Christ of giving. And I'm just grateful, even in the worst moments, for being alive, alive in Christ, and alive for the life that never ends. And I think there's I think maybe there's just yet one more. The gratitude of what? And I don't know, I'm still in the process of learning, you understand. And so you can help teach me. Let me tell you a story, so we have to close. Uh, 
my my dad did not go to church when I was a little guy because we lived in a Lutheran community where the women sat on one side, the men sat on the other, and he was not a Lutheran. And he didn't go to the liturgy, and everybody could stand up, they didn't even need their candles, they got the whole thing memorized. And he was a fish out of water, but that's an appropriate thing for northern Minnesota. And so he just didn't go. He said, I'm not comfortable. So Mom and I would go by ourselves. We lived about, about two miles from the church in northern Minnesota, where the temperatures would range as high as 90 during the summer and almost that far below zero during the winter. And Mom and I would walk these two miles. And I guess I was probably about four. I'm not sure I'd start to school you, but. But it was a cold, cold winter day, that I remember. And Mom and I walked to St. John's Lutheran Church. It was cold, well, well below zero. And we, we, we walked pretty fast. And after church, we came out and the wind was blowing, probably about somewhere between 20 and 120 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, and we came out of church that end. Was cold, and that was before women wore pants to church, you know. And so we started on our way home. And roughly about half the way home, those two miles, is the Thief River. There is a bridge that goes over the Thief River, and we started walking across. And just as we got about in the middle, in the middle of that bridge. All of a sudden, the wind came shooting down and caught us in the middle of the bridge to the point that there was some of you know what I'm We could not breathe. It just, the cold and the wind just took it away. And here I am standing with my, with my beautiful mom out in the middle of the Thief River on that darn bridge and we couldn't breathe. And she had turned toward me both to kind of shield me, but also because if you turn away from the wind, you can still catch a breath now and then. And I looked at her, and she looked down at me, and she burst out laughing. This moment was so impossible. And she looked at me, and she started laughing, and she held out her arms, and she took me And she held me close, and I started laughing. And we laughed at that moment as slowly we made our way across that bridge. I think, I think that may be my moment of conversion. <laughs> Where for the first time, I sensed that there was a love deeper than anything I could ever imagine. And that even in these awful moments when it is so dreadfully cold and when there does not seem to be any way out, there is still a sense of humor locked deep in the heart of every one of God's kids because we know we're embraced. And it was not mom, it was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in that moment of being loved, in the most comical and eternal sort of way, there was something that stuck in that moment. And I learned more in one embrace from my mom on that bridge with her laughing at what was around us and her loving me. I learned more about the love of God probably than I have in all the preachers I've ever heard. What's your moment? Where are your moments? Because there's one, it seems to me, there's one more step after the gratitude, which just sneaks up on you. It's like crossing the bridge when you're four years old amidst cold wind. And it just is that moment when all of a sudden you just gotta say, Oh, I love you, Heavenly Father. I love you. It's beyond gratitude, it's your whole being. And it is a presence of God which is not out there in space, not place, but 
the great here. I love you, Lord Jesus. It just, just spontaneously. You didn't have to go to church to do that. You didn't have to start praying. To, just, it's just there. The creation around you. I love you. I love you, Holy Spirit. And so all the way from, from just that moment of gratitude all the way to I love you. And you know who taught me that? A woman. So St. Paul gets most of it right and beautiful, powerful, forever right. Even someone like St. Paul gets it wrong occasionally. Because women are every bit as gifted, as powerful, as present, as filled with God's love and gratitude and all of the kinds of gifts that God pours into our lives so undeserving, undeserving. And that's a pity, certain, but it is the place in which I think you will say out there. Because the sermon, the service, the growth, the love, the gratitude to the love and the love beyond to eternity that still grows and still coming. We're still going into it. So whether you're 12 or 87, it's still there. And beyond still there, it's there by God grace for ever. Heavenly Father, I love you. Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, I love you. Holy Spirit, my friend, my comfort, I love you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Oh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious for you. The Lord lift up his confidence upon you and give you peace.